All right. Uh, good morning again. I uh, hope you're well. Um, had a little crisis or two this morning, so uh, some of my PowerPoint this morning uh, is incomplete, so you're going to have to work a little harder than usual because some of the things that I would normally or hope to put up on the screen aren't going to be up there this morning. Last Sunday morning, uh, the first Sunday of the year, we began a, a new six-week series of messages on our values, kind of new year, new start, refresh, get regrounded in those things that over the years, uh, in the last few years, we've articulated as things that we believe God has called us to in particular. And so this morning, we continue uh, with that. Uh, last week, we looked at the kind of the overarching uh, prologue or introduction to our values. It goes like this. Following the Lord Jesus, we strive to, and we talked all about that. This morning, we'll look at uh, the first of the five particular values that fall under that umbrella. Before that, uh, before we get to that, though, let me pray one more time. God, open us up to the things uh, that you would have us learn uh, this morning, the people that you would have us become. Help us to present ourselves to you as malleable clay in your hands. Uh, shape us, mold us. Do with us, heart, mind, and spirit, what you will. We depend on you. We need you. We look to you. Make us available. Help us. I pray and ask that as my words are true to your word, that they be taken to heart. If my words stray or deviate in any way from your word, may they be quickly and ever, forever forgotten. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Following the Lord Jesus, we strive to, and then comes this first, Love all people unconditionally. And there's a reason that one's first. In some ways, it has preeminence over the others. Following the Lord Jesus, we strive to love all people unconditionally. And that will be our subject this morning. But where in the scriptures, I thought as I was uh, preparing this morning's message, where to begin, what scripture to begin with, what do we use as our foundation where do we begin? We hold the books of the Old and New Testament as one of the questions to the elders and deacons, uh, one of the ordination questions uh, noted. We hold them to be uh, the authoritative word of God, inspired by God and sufficient for all matters of life and faith. That's why we always begin with the scriptures. But where to begin this morning to touch on loving all people unconditionally? We could begin in a number of places. We could begin in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, where the command so important to Jesus was first given, to love your neighbor as yourself. We could read in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is saying that the greatest command is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. We could read an illustration, Jesus' parable in Luke's gospel that we know is the parable of the Good Samaritan. We could read in John's gospel, Jesus' words, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no person than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. We could read Jesus' words in his Sermon on the Mount about loving one's adversaries. We could begin with some of the words with which the Apostle Paul taught the new Christians in Galatia, the way of Jesus. He wrote, the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. And you get the picture. We could begin in a lot of places in the scriptures this morning, and in some ways we will. But I thought that rather than focusing this morning on what Jesus said, we could instead look at what Jesus did how Jesus interacted with people, how Jesus lived, how Jesus modeled what Jesus taught through his life and actions. And for the sake of organization and clarity, to name some specific kinds of people Jesus loved because our stated value is not just loving people, but more specifically, loving all people loving all people, loving all people unconditionally in the way of Jesus. First, we need a definition, though, of the biblical idea of love, which many of you know and understand. We use this word today, love, in our language and in our speech to talk about pizza, to talk about the Niners, to talk about puppies, my youngest daughter, and otters. Who doesn't just love otters? Can we see it? Yeah. Okay. 
uh, to love a TV show, a musical artist, a favorite app, whatever. What are some of the things that you and that we love? Coffee, chocolate ice, any kind of ice cream. What's that? The Giants. Donuts. Yes, we love donuts. Those are the things in our world, in our language that we love, but the biblical idea, the biblical word, the Greek, if you will, is so much richer when it talks about love. Uh, getting help from the 10th century uh, theologian Anselm of Canterbury. Here's how the scriptures would define love. To consistently will and choose what is good for and what benefits another person. Help from Anselm. To wish another person well and to act in that direction. To honor someone by conferring upon that person dignity, value, and blessing. There's no mention of romance. There's no mention of puppies. There's no mention of feelings in any of that necessarily, though not devoid of feelings. To consistently will and choose what is good for and what benefits another person. To wish another person well and to act in that direction. To honor someone by conferring upon that person dignity, value, and blessing. This is the biblical idea of love according to the scriptures. And clearly Jesus was about love, but what was and is also interesting about Jesus was that he didn't just talk about love. What was particularly interesting to me about the Lord Jesus was who this first century Jewish rabbi loved. For starters, Jesus exhibited love, in other words, other-centered benevolence toward women. Doesn't sound all that astonishing in our day and age, but in first century Palestine, a woman's social sphere was generally limited to her nuclear family, the household. Jewish writings made it clear that, quote, it is the way of a woman to stay at home and it is the way of a man to go out into the marketplaces. While literacy was an important element in teaching young men to study their scriptures, it was a luxury for girls and women because the Old Testament was explicit about teaching scripture to sons. Women were excluded from studying the Torah in that way. It wasn't normal for men to speak directly to women in public. Reference Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well in John chapter 4, which was so surprising to his disciples. However, not only did the Gospels record Jesus speaking to women, they also Jesus depict Jesus doing so with an element of tenderness. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus doesn't simply heal the woman with a bleeding disorder. He calls her daughter, a term of endearment. In Luke 13, when Jesus addressed a woman doubled over from spiritual oppression, Jesus calls her a daughter of Abraham, conferring upon her, this woman, the same value as any man might have, Jewish man in that culture, which was unusual. Moreover, not only did Jesus allow his ministry to be largely supported by the financial offerings of women, but it was to women that Jesus first appeared after his resurrection you recall. In an era and culture of gender segregation and gender subordination, Jesus treated women with surprising dignity. If someone wanted to consider such a principle that may be at play in similar but different ways today in our context, one might ask how Jesus might treat people whose genders are considered by many in some ways to be second tier or lesser. And Jesus loved the poor. His teachings humanized the poor and demonstrated God's incredible concern for their well-being. And in doing so, Jesus decried those who ignored or disenfranchised in his day the poor. He began his public ministry in the Gospel of Luke by declaring publicly, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. To his disciples, Jesus said, blessed are you who are poor in Luke's gospel. Not poor in spirit, but poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. And when you were given a banquet, Jesus said, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Every indication is that Jesus spent as much of his time with the have-nots as the haves. 
And Jesus extended his love, in other words, the love of God, to oppressors, to those who oppressed others. Strange. The Jewish people had no love for Rome, understandably, and their desire for a messianic deliverer was in large part to see the Roman oppressors defeated, squashed, and banished. And yet when a Roman centurion sent messengers to Jesus, asking Jesus to come and heal his dying servant, Jesus not only welcomed the centurion's request and healed the centurion's servant, but Jesus also affirmed the centurion's faith. One of Jesus' 12 disciples, Levi, had been a tax collector for the Roman government, effectively working for the enemy, and Jesus welcomed him. And when hanging on the cross with Roman soldiers having put him there after whipping and scourging and mocking him, Jesus loved them and said, Father, forgive these men, these oppressors. Forgive them. And Jesus loved people from different regions, cultures, ethnicities, and races, what might be called racial enemies. Jesus welcomed a Syrophoenician woman, a foreigner, a foreigner, flat out foreigner. And then Jesus healed her daughter. The hatred and the disdain between the Jews and their intermarried neighbors, the Samaritans, dated back centuries. And yet when Jesus wanted to travel from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, and the standard route for such for good and faithful Jews was to go around Samaria rather than a shorter route straight through it in order to avoid these despised people. Jesus chose a route straight through Samaria, leading to his gracious interaction with that Samaritan woman at a well one afternoon. And then right after that, a whole bunch of people from her town nearby. Another time when an expert in the Jewish law was asking Jesus how to interpret the law and how to understand the word neighbor in the law, Jesus told him a completely startling parable, the hero of which, the hero of which was of all people a Samaritan. God help us. Imagine, imagine what that part of the world, that geographic part of the world, could be like today if the disposition and commitment of the people there today toward those of different ethnicities, races, and cultures than their own were like the loving disposition and com commitment of Jesus toward historic racial enemies. Imagine what that part of the world could be like today. Imagine what our country's history, 400 years of it, might have been like if we'd have been able to do the same in our early years, our early centuries, and along the way, and today, in a country that, as Martin Luther King Jr. on his weekend noted, is the most segregated time on Sunday mornings. And Jesus loved people who had been labeled by their culture as unclean. We don't use that term explicitly in our culture, in our world, in our lives, in our religion today. They did in Jesus' day. Much of the Old Testament is concerned with moral and ceremonial cleanliness, purity. And that concern for purity extends into the New Testament through the religion of the Pharisees. A person in Jesus' day could become unclean. Just imagine if we labeled one another, I mean outwardly, because I think we sort of do inwardly, silently, passively. Imagine if we did that today. A person in Jesus' day could become unclean through exposure to potentially contagious diseases or through bodily fluids that could carry disease or from eating unclean foods. Then once someone was unclean, they became socially ostracized. They had to avoid sacred spaces and duties until through processes and time they could become purified. Among the most stigmatized unclean people in Jesus' day were those afflicted with the skin disease leprosy, which was often grossly disfiguring and struck fear into the minds of most people. And yet Jesus, when approached by a man with leprosy who wanted to be healed, did not back away from that man. 
as any other good person would have done, and especially a holy person. But instead, Jesus moved toward that man and healed that man by touching that man. An act of incredible grace and tenderness to a man who had probably not experienced the warmth of human touch in years. On another occasion, Jesus exhibits the same sort of gentle love to a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, 12 years, which would have put her in the category easily and for a long time of unclean. And yet when this woman made her way through a crowd and touched Jesus, rather than publicly berating the woman as any other religious leader would have done in that day, Jesus complimented her faith. In the eighth chapter of John's gospel, Jesus interacts kindly with a prostitute in public, not demeaning her as other religious leaders did, people who were unclean. And Jesus was known to eat with sinners. Again, we don't really use that phrase outwardly, verbally, explicitly today, but we know who the sinners are, don't we? If there had been drunks and addicts and panhandlers and failures and misfits in Jesus' world and Jesus' day, one might suspect that Jesus would have hung out with them also, as he was known to do. He hangs around with tax collectors and sinners, they said about him. In some, Jesus loved people that many of us and many in the church have struggled to love and in some cases have chosen not to love despite, as Thomas Merton once wrote, our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. Our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy or to even think about such. Who have been the people that you have found difficult to love or resistant to loving, either with your head or with your heart, with your life, with your words, with your feelings, with your imagination. People who make you uncomfortable, people who are different, people who believe different things, have different faith, different religion, different practice. People who are a threat to my way or my life or my reality. People who to love would cost me something people whose lives are wrecked, needy people, mean people, self-righteous people, religious people, irreverent people. Who have been the people that you have found most difficult to love in your life, in your world? You remember Jesus' words in chapter 25 of Matthew's gospel, for I was hungry. I, he puts himself in the place of I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. All ways of loving people. So uh, John Coma uh, participates in our men's Bible study on Friday mornings. He is here this morning to share a little bit about one way that he's had an opportunity to love a certain group of people. John, where yet? Right Come on up. Thanks, Shannon. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Coma. I'm uh, the executive director of Hillcrest Chaplaincy. Now, I've got a question you guys. And you, this should be easy. There's a high school just four miles away from here. And it's not Aragon. It's not Hillsdale. And they don't have a football team. Do you know, do you know what high school that is? It's called Hillcrest. Hillcrest is the school that's attached to the San Mateo Youth Services building way up there on the hill in the northeast corner between 280 and uh, 92. You probably pass it a million times. 
and you don't know what it is. That's the Youth Services Center. But Hillcrest High School is part of that. And Hillcrest Chaplaincy, which I'm a part of, has served uh, as chaplains to that audience, that group, for over 65 years. Now, it's kind of special in that there's only a 15% 15 15 graduation rate. That 78% of the students, their families, live below the poverty level. And that it's nearly 100% minorities. Those are some sad, sad statistics. But they get even sadder if you look at the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that there isn't much hope, it seems that 94% of uh, those kids are, have the chance of recurring in terms of being a criminal uh, in their youth. And so we're here to stem the tide, to stop the cycle of poverty, ignorance, and we do that through Jesus Christ. We introduce these kids to Jesus Christ for 65 years. Uh, and you've helped us as a church do that by sponsoring us and allowing us to have real chaplains uh, that are from the street that can talk these kids' language and be with them and serve them. And it's a, really a ministry to, uh, like in Matthew 25, Jesus talks about the least of these. And let me tell you why I got involved in this ministry. I've never been, before I started to, work, to be a part of this ministry, I was never in a juvenile hall. I was never in a jail. And it just came upon me that the Lord had given me so many blessings, so many blessings, that I wanted to stretch myself. I wanted to go someplace that was a little tougher to serve. And he showed me this ministry. And I tell you what, it's been an additional blessing in my life that to see these kids, to see some of their lives change is so fulfilling. And so what I'm asking you to do has been something that I've been praying about for this group um, prior to this talk. And I prayed that the Holy Spirit would touch your heart, would tug at your heart, would give you a little, maybe even unauditory whisper in your ear that this might be something that would challenge you to the next level of knowing Jesus. If you feel like you're ready for something like that, I'm going to be available after the service, uh, and then I can share more information with you. I'm not sure if we've got the information up on the screen, but you're going to see our website, which is pretty simple. It's hillcrestchaplaincy.org. And you can take a look at some, uh, some things on that website if you'd like. You can talk to me, and I'm, I'll, uh, I'll gladly give you my uh, phone number and text. But the best way to get a hold of me is text, because I never answer the phone. So please text me, and I'd love to talk to you more about it, answer your questions. Uh, we do have the ability with our two chaplains to help you learn more about how to talk to these kids, because that's part of the problem. How do I talk to someone that seems so different than me? Well, number one, they aren't that much different than you. They're a lot like you. And so you can connect. And what these kids need most is an adult in their life that cares about them. 94% of these kids do not have a male figure in their life that's a positive illustration of what, of goodness, really. So if you're a good person and you care those are all the requirements you need to have. So I invite you to be a part of Hillcrest Ministry. Thank you.
Thank you, John. It's awesome. Again, Thomas Merton, our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. Our first value as a congregation uh, following the Lord Jesus is to love all people unconditionally, emphasizing this morning the all and the unconditionally. Without prejudice, without regard to convenience, time, energy, money, without regard for a person's perceived worthiness, or what we may eventually get out of that relationship or action, regardless of what we may or may not think of the person to be loved, or what we worry loving such a person may infer about us, about ourselves, about who we are, about what we believe, about our values. When Jesus said to love your neighbor as yourself, there wasn't any fine print about who was not included or who was included. Uh, Fine print is everywhere in our world, isn't it? Like our lives. And who likes fine print? Fine print in our world is notorious for noting exceptions, limits, terms, exclusions, qualifiers, disqualifiers. But when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, there was no fine print about certain people being exempt from or included, excluded from our loving and our love. In fact, the evidence points to exactly the opposite, that Jesus' invitation to love one's neighbors was radically, radically inclusive. I don't know if you've seen this T-shirt. I think we got it back up on the PowerPoint. Have you seen that T-shirt? I need to get one of those. Last week, I stumbled across this thought-provoking statement. You will never look into the eyes of someone God does not love. You will never look into the eyes of someone whom God does not love. Which brings to mind Jesus' words in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And we know that when John and Jesus talk about world, cosmos, they have in mind everyone. Every, the good, the bad, the ugly, the compliant, the cordial, the obstinate, and those whose lives seem to be a complete train wreck. What mattered most to, to Jesus was loving people, all people, no strings attached, because when there are strings attached, it's no longer the kind of love Jesus envisioned and that he lived. If God measures our lives, if God measures our lives, He does so according to how we love. And the world has an almost insatiable, unlimited need for love. I don't know if you've noticed. For the economists out there, the demand side of this equation is astronomical, seemingly infinite, while the supply side seems to be limited or somewhat limited. And yet I believe that with God, there is actually an unlimited amount of love available for those who need it because God is love. And God calls and empowers his people, first of all, to love. The fruit of the Spirit, which God gives to his people in abundance, According to the Apostle Paul in the Scriptures, the first of the fruit is love. The first evidence of the Holy Spirit in a person's life is love. If a person is filled with God's Spirit, she loves. She cannot help but love others, all others. The first sign that a person is filled with Holy Spirit indwelt Spirit is that they love. It's a verb. And back to my point, there is an unlimited, there are an unlimited number of people in our world to love, just in your world, my world. And I can't love them all. You can't love them all. I don't have enough time or energy or resources for that. At some point, one person can only love so much, but most people, I think, haven't reached their threshold. They've stopped short of the max. I have veered off the track into other things, hobbies, distractions, indulgences, pursuits, activities, vacation. But God in Christ has invited us, called us, to love all people unconditionally. There's no fine print, no narrowing or limiting who we're called to love or how we're called to love. Therefore, I want to end this morning, this message, with just a little exercise. 
In the pew rack in front of you, there's a white card, a blank card. Grab one of those and a pen that goes with it and write down your answers to these three questions. And no one's going to look at your answers unless you voluntarily share or show or tell them to someone. This is just for you, between you and God, for your own benefit, an exercise for you. We're not going to bring them up. We're not going to hand them over. We're not going to do anything. It's just for you. Three questions. First, what keeps you from loving all people unconditionally? What are, for you, barriers to Jesus' call to love? What keeps you from loving people? Go behind the scenes. Take a little uh, deeper look. Look behind the curtain, behind the scenes. What keeps you from loving all people unconditionally? Maybe it's apathy or ambivalence or antipathy or jealousy or rivalry or contempt or bitterness or judgmentalism or fear or prejudice or simply self-absorption. What keeps you from loving all people unconditionally? Number two, who in the past and in the present has been difficult for you to love or to want to love in Jesus, in the way of Jesus? And number three, who specifically is God calling you to love this week? And that might be a single individual or it might be a group, a collective, a demographic of people. Who is God calling you to love this week? This, these three questions are worth way more than 60 seconds, worthy of more than that. I'm going to give you 60 seconds to work on it. Now you can spend your afternoon on them if you'd like. Take 60 seconds. Think, listen, pray, consider, write, and vow. Ready, sit, go. Pray through it this week. C.S. Lewis wrote, don't waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor, just act as if you did. And as soon as we do this, we will find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love her. The renowned Christian psychiatrist Carl Menninger wrote interesting words for a psychiatrist. Love cures people both the ones who give it and the ones who receive it. The church should be the most loving place in town, and by that I mean the most loving physical campus building place, but also the community of people wherever we're gathered, wherever we are. There's no reason that the church should not be the most loving community and body in town. And I would like to do something I've never done before and will never do again, I'm quite certain, and that is to close the message by quoting Jimi Hendrix. (laughs) When the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will then know peace. Maybe so. Let's pray. Thank you for loving us. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for demonstrating for us the way of love. In the streets of Jerusalem, around the Sea of Galilee, at a wedding in Cana, at a well at a crossroads in Samaria, on a hill called Golgotha. Thank you for loving us and along with us the world or the world and along with the world us. Fill us with your spirit, empower us, God, to live into the reality of your kingdom among us and in us. Bring it about fully as you through us love one another, love the people of our world in and through Jesus. Amen.